VIX presents Dangerously Yours, a half hour of romance and adventure starring Victor Jory in Barclay Square. First, here's a good thing to remember when you catch a cold. The best known home remedy for relieving miseries of colds is Vicks Vapor Rub. And now. I am Adventure. In my name, men have traversed the highways, the byways, the skyways of the world, have traveled old trails and blazed new ones. I am the fire that burns in the heart of youth, that makes men dream and dare and conquer. I am dangerously yours. This week, come with me to England to meet a young American who inherited an ancient house and lived one of the strangest adventures any man has ever known. Peter Standish of Barclay Square. Tell me I have been very ill. Perhaps I have. But I've also been on the most inconceivable adventure that could be imagined. I have crossed the bridge from the present to the past. I have gone from this century back into the 18th century. I have traded places with my own great-great-grandfather, Peter Standish. That same great-great-grandfather whose portrait hangs there over the fireplace. When this strange adventure began, I was with Marjorie. Peter, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Why, you might have sat for that portrait of your great-great-grandfather yourself. Marjorie, wouldn't you love to change places with him? Just imagine walking the quiet streets of London in the 18th century, breathing pure air instead of gasoline, riding in sedan chairs instead of taxi cabs. Wouldn't that be an adventure? Mm, Yes, but it would be an impossible one, Peter. No, you're wrong. What I'm getting at is this. That to God, there is no past, present, and future. Time as we know it is nothing but an idea in the mind, in the mind of man. Do you see, Marjorie? Peter, darling, you've been working too hard. You aren't being practical or sensible. You haven't been from the time you inherited this house and came here to live. I don't think it's good for you. This house gave me the idea. I tell you the possibility of going back in time is perfectly logical. It may sound convincing, Peter, but of course it's impossible. No, my dear, the past is over and gone. You're wrong, Marjorie. Look, I have some of the past right here in my hands. It's Peter Standish's diary. Would you like to know a little about him? I've been studying it so hard I know it almost by heart. His trip from New York to England took 27 days in a bark called the General Wolf. It says, too, that Reynolds didn't want to paint his portrait. That's the one over the fireplace. I've been curious about that. But he must have painted it. It's obviously Reynolds. Yes, that's certain. Now, let's see. Oh, yes. He married the eldest Pettigrew girl, Kate, in this very house. They had children who died here. And there was a younger sister, Helen. Her family tried to force her into a marriage she hated. The diary stops before that's settled. And look here. Please, Peter, it's all very interesting, but suppose you tell me about it some other time. Oh, you look so tired and flushed. I'm going to get you some tea. I wish you understood. Marjorie, are you sure you want to marry me when there's so much you don't understand about me? Of course I want to marry you, darling. You're just a little tired. You don't really think you could go back into the 18th century. Now, you just sit there while I get you some tea. I sat there staring about the room, staring at the rich, mellowed walls, the satin-smooth tables, the dignified chairs. And the past was alive in that room, and I knew it. The firelight flickered on the ceiling and touched to gold the face of my ancestor, Peter Standish. And in some curious way, I felt as though I were looking at myself. And then outside, I heard... I heard a coach on cobblestones. And then I laughed to myself. A coach. Cobblestones. Why, they had had wood blocks in Barclay Square for ages. They were quieter even than the asphalt in New York. And then I heard a woman's footstep. And I turned, expecting to see Marjorie, and saw... Oh! I bid you good evening. I suppose you're my cousin Peter from America. 
We had your note that you'd arrived in London. How did you get into the house without any of us hearing you? I jumped to my feet, staring at her. Staring at this woman dressed in hooped satin, her hair piled high on her head, her shoulders bare. I touched my own sleeve. That was satin, too. And I looked down and saw that I was dressed in the clothes of the man in the portrait. And then I looked to the wall, but it was gone. There was no portrait there. Well, Cousin Peter, are you going to stand there staring at me all evening? I, I beg your pardon. You must be my cousin, my cousin Kate. Or is it Helen? I'm Kate, sir. But how did you get here in all this rain without getting wet? Well, I, I came in a coach. Oh, I see. I rang the bell, but no one answered, so I came in. The bell? You rang the bell? What bell? Oh, oh I mean, the knocker, of course. Well, in any event, I'm most happy to welcome you, Cousin Peter. And if you'll come with me, my mother, sister, and brother will also bid you welcome. We've all been looking forward to this meeting for some time. I followed her out into the hall, my heart pounding with excitement. The miracle had come to pass. I was in the 18th century. We went down the hall, and there in the gracious candlelit sitting room was the Pettigrew family. Lady Anne and Helen, and the young Pettigrew, Tom, looking a bit the worse for drink. And there was also a small, fat, unpleasant-looking man who I judged to be Helen's unwanted suitor, Mr. Throssell. Lady Anne gave me a most cordial welcome. Well, well, Cousin Peter, what a delight this visit of yours is indeed. Kate has been all aflutter about it for weeks. Indeed, so have we all. How gracious of her and of you. This is my other daughter, Helen. How do you do, Cousin Peter? How do you do, Cousin Helen? And this is my son, Tom. How do you do? Who will no doubt show you around town. And this is Helen's fiancé, Mr. Throssell. How do you do, Mr. Throssell, gentlemen? It's my pleasure, gentlemen. Uh... Did you like the cashmere shawl your aunt sent you for your birthday, Helen? Cashmere shawl? Is there a shawl in that parcel? I haven't opened it yet. Peter, how could you possibly know it was a shawl? How could you possibly know? I don't, really. It, it was only a guess, you see. Well, shawls are so popular nowadays. Well, aren't you clever to guess? It is a shawl. My sister wrote me about it. Well, come now. You must be shown to your room. Dinner's not so long away. Come, my dear boy, Come. Come in. Oh, hello, Helen. Pardon the intrusion, Peter. Mother thought I should see if you were comfortable. I'm very comfortable, thank you. Where's Kate? She's helping Mother downstairs. Uh, Cousin Peter, may I ask you something? Why, of course. Are you in love with Kate? Well, I... Why do you ask? You never saw her before this afternoon. And yet you and Mother arranged your betrothal before you ever came to England. Of course... It may be a young and stupid fancy on my part, but I always thought that two people had to meet before they fell in love. It seems strange. You're quite right. Helen. Yes? Will you help me? There's a lot that's strange to me about this country. I'll need a bit of guidance. Why, yes, I'd be very glad to. And now I'll leave you. Good afternoon, Cousin Peter. Helen. Yes, Peter? You're very sweet. Yes? And I think my great-great-grandfather was absolutely screwy. Screwy? Uh, uh, that, uh, that's just a New York expression. Oh. Uh, good afternoon, Helen. Good afternoon, Cousin Peter. Oh, excuse me for banging the door. <laughs> Helen, a smile curved to fit my heart, eyes that danced in the candlelight, hair like blue-black midnight sky. In the days that followed, I could not keep my eyes nor my thoughts away from her. And yet I knew that I must marry Kate. But Kate, after the first few days, kept away from me. It was Helen that was by my side constantly. It was Helen who took me to Sir Joshua Reynolds' studio. Turn your face toward the window, please. Hmm. Mr. Standish, I am very sorry, but I must refuse the commission. I cannot paint you. What? Why, Sir Joshua, you did paint. Uh, I mean, that's impossible. I wish I could paint you, Mr. Standish. 
But I'm a painter of realities. And there's uh, something in your face and your eyes that's unreal. Something I would never be able to capture. I, I, I never heard of such rot. Come, Peter. There's no point in arguing. But he must paint me. He did paint me. He... Oh, never mind. You wouldn't understand. Good day, Sir Joshua. I hope you'll change your mind. Change my mind? I'd as soon paint the devil as to paint you. Kate, wasn't this to be my dance? Yes, but I... I have a headache. I don't quite feel up to dancing just now. Well, since you have a headache, Kate... Let's go outside in the balcony for a breath of air. Well, I, I really shouldn't. I, I wanted to see Mother. Uh, just for a moment, Kate. Come, let's go out here. It's a beautiful night, isn't it? Yes, I, I suppose so. Kate, what's the matter? You've been avoiding me all evening. Have I? You certainly haven't been avoiding my sister. Don't tell me you're jealous. You don't need to be, you know. Jealous? No, I'm relieved. But I fear for Helen. Peter Standish, you're a very strange and frightening man. Oh, now, Kate, you're letting gossip upset you. I know what people are saying about me, and of course it's ridiculous. Yes, you know what people are saying. And you know what I'm thinking right now. You always know. You know what's going to happen before it happens. Oh, no, Kate, no. Not the way you think. And why are you looking so startled? There's nothing to be afraid of. Oh, I thought you loved me. You, you mustn't talk like that. Why, my dear, we're going to be married. Married? Do you think I'd marry you when I'm hard put to it to force myself to remain alone with you? Sir Joshua saw it. Everyone sees it. There's something that's... that's not human about you. Kate, you're overwrought. You'll, you'll feel differently in the morning. In the morning, I shall drive to Budley. I cannot stay in this house with you any longer. I see. You're breaking our engagement? You can't do that. Oh, can't I? How smugly you say it. So you think there are no limits to what a wizard can do with a woman. The women all press after you, don't they? But no woman wishes to dance with you twice, except Helen. Peter Standish, I never was so afraid of anything in my life as I am of you. And you think you can make me marry you? <laughs> I'd as soon marry the devil. I'm leaving London in the morning and I'll not return to this house as long as you're in it. And you can be sure I'll do everything in my power to get you out of it. Oh, Helen. Peter, come and dance with me. You're not afraid of me, Helen. You're not afraid to dance with me. How can you be afraid of someone you love? Oh, come and dance with me, Peter. In just a moment, we will bring you the second act of Dangerously Yours. Well, here it is fall again, and first thing you know, the children may be coming home from school with nasty colds. Too bad. But this time, Mother, don't take needless chances with untried remedies. Instead, relieve distress the modern way most young mothers now use. When your child catches a cold, rub the throat, chest, and back with Vicks Vapor Rub. Then see how quickly VapoRub starts to work to bring grand relief as it penetrates. Penetrates into the cold, congested upper bronchial tubes with its special soothing medicinal vapors and at the same time stimulates. Stimulates chest and back surfaces like a warming poultice. This penetrating, stimulating action of VapoRub keeps on working for hours to bring relief and comfort. And often, most of the distress of a cold is gone overnight. Now stick to VapoRub this winter, Mother, because only VapoRub gives you this special penetrating, stimulating action to relieve miseries of colds. Vicks VapoRub. And now, the second act of Dangerously Yours, starring Victor Jory in Barclay Square. <laughs> Very late. Are you going to walk up and down the library all night? I I can't sleep, Helen. You're worried about Kate, aren't you? Well, don't be. She'll be all right when she returns. 
Peter, tell me what all this mystery means so that I can explain it to her. Tell me how you can know things you couldn't know. First, it was about my shawl, and, and since then, oh, so many things. Well, Helen, I... But it's true, Peter. You do see ahead. We all know you do. Oh, Peter, tell me how you do it. I want to see ahead, too. I'd love to know about the future. But I couldn't tell you, dear. You wouldn't understand. There aren't any words to make you understand. You say there aren't any words because these things must come to your mind in visions, Peter. And I think I could see them, too, through your eyes. Oh, let me try. Look at me, Peter. Look at me. Very well. I'm look... looking. And I was right. I can see. I see this room, this very room. It blazes with magic lights, Peter. And there's your portrait on the wall. Then Reynolds did paint it, just as you said he did. Now I see sunshine, white clouds... Great birds bigger than a hundred eagles. Aeroplanes. Machines with men in them. And below them, reaching to the sky, a fairy dream city. And, oh, Peter, look down on the ground. You're looking, Helen, into the great age of mechanism. Trains, automobiles, factories, radio. An age of miracles and of great truths. That's the future, Helen. Peter, you know the future. Tell me ours. I don't know our future. But I do know I love you. If ever a man loved a woman, I do love you. I loved you before I ever saw you. In my first dream of you, coming with a candle from somewhere far away to meet me. Oh, Helen, I can't play a part anymore. I myself, you see, I'm myself and I'm muddling everything up. This isn't possible. This isn't my world or yours. It isn't my life and it isn't your life. Oh, Peter, take me away with you. Take me back to wherever you came from. I can't, Helen. I can't. Then don't leave me. Oh, Peter, don't leave me. Oh, my beloved. When I kissed Kate, that was the first Peter Standish kissing his betrothed. But there's never been a kiss like this since the world began. Kate, so you've come back from Budley. Well, let me tell you something. Your Peter has asked for Helen's hand in marriage. What do you think of that? Mother, you wouldn't let Helen marry him. You wouldn't do that. This marriage must not be. Don't worry, my dear. I shall see to that. Well, Kate, I'm glad to see you again. Hello, Kate, dearest. Mr. Standish, when you came into this house, although the door was shut and locked, did you come from America? Yes, we are all very curious about that, Mr. Standish. What is the answer? The answer is yes. I do come from America. Oh, really? Mr. Standish, you used some very peculiar expressions at times, and I made a note of them. You said they were expressions used in New York. That's right. Indeed. Well, on my way home, I stopped at the legation in Grosvenor Square. Should not the American minister, Mr. Adams, know what words are used in New York? Mr. Adams is from Massachusetts. I asked him, nevertheless. He had never heard of one of them. As a matter of fact, those expressions are not used in America, and they're certainly not used in England. If they're used at all, the devils use them in hell. It is true Peter Standish came from New York in the General Wolf. You've taken possession of his body. What have you done with him? Kate, I think this has gone quite far enough. I think perhaps we should call your brother Tom to deal with this creature. In the old days, he'd have been burned at the stake. Why not now? You still burn people? You burn women accused of witchcraft. You should be whipped for this, sir. Yes, whip people if they're crazy. Flog them in public as you flog your half-naked lunatics at Bedlam with a crowd of your gaping Londoners looking on. You savages. You, you forget yourself, sir. Your son Tom, madam, you're proud of him, aren't you? You think he's a gentleman. A typical English gentleman of the time. Well, he is. But what a time. Dirt, disease, cruelty, smells. You, Kate... You may be a fool, but you're the best of the lot. For you're trying in your silly way to help Helen now. But as for you, Lady Anne, I've seen you in Sheridan's plays, and I've read you in Jane Austen's novels. You know what you want, and you plow straight ahead over everything and through everything like a... 
A tank lumbering through the mud. You hit like a tank. Good Francis Adams, what tank means. No, no, it's not Charles Francis Adams. It's John Adams, second president of the United States. Charles Adams won't be born until the Civil War in 1861. Peter, Peter. What's one more blunder among so many? Your Peter Standish came from New York to Plymouth in the General Wolf. This Peter Standish flew from New York to Plymouth. Shall I make a few more blunders for you to gibber at, Kate? Shall I drive you to Budley in my car at 90 miles an hour? You fiend from hell. What do I care about you? You're all over and done with, all of you. You're dead. You've rotted away in, in your graves. You're all ghosts. That's what you are, ghosts. Do you hear? Go- Come, Helen. Let's get out of here. And I was in love with the past. I was in love with the past. My dearest. Oh, my dearest. I turned and there was Helen. Helen, born of the 18th century. All loveliness, all grace, all beauty. And I caught her to me and rested my cheek against her hair. And something inside me was weeping. For I knew I was holding Helen for the last time. I fought that thought. Helen. Oh, Helen. You know, my dearest, each night I've said, he must go back. But each morning we'd make some new plan together, and I'd think, let me have just one more day. No, I've said I would stay, and I will stay. I was a fool and a weakling to talk like that. It won't happen again. I I couldn't face my own life without you. What life is this for you? Be brave, Peter, and listen. My life, my London, are nightmares to you. Oh, don't be sad. Just think. Out of all the millions of lovers... Since time began, we two alone have been chosen for this miracle. And it is a miracle. Oh, think of what has been given us. Not of what is taken away. Nothing can be taken away. That we came together as we did proves that we weren't meant to lose each other. Yes. Yes, and we shall be together always, Peter. Not in my time or in yours, but in God's. Yes, darling. It must be that way. But I have neither the will nor the strength to leave you. Love will give you the strength. You have your life to live out in the future, Peter. Don't be too sad about a girl who's been dead to you so long. And in my life, as I grow old, your youth will seem to me eternal youth. For you will come, won't you? Young as I see you now to my grave in St. Mark's churchyard. And you'll find me, for I'll ask for a stone with the letters cut deep so they won't wear away before you come. Oh, darling. Darling, I love you now. I shall love you in my own time and in whatever time may come. Then this is our parting, Peter. Goodbye, my dear. Goodbye, my darling. I left her and walked down the corridor into the library. I was dazed. Dazed and empty of everything but sorrow. And there were my own things about me again... 20th century things. There was the portrait on the wall. I felt weak and shaken and bereft. I sat there by the fire all night. In the morning, I walked to St. Mark's churchyard. When I returned, Marjorie was in the library. Peter. Hello, Marjorie. Oh, Peter, you know me. You know me. Know you? Why, of course I know you. For weeks, you haven't recognized any of us, Peter. You've been very ill. Ill? Yes. Yes, I've been ill. But you're all right now. You look yourself again. Oh, thank God you're all right now. Marjorie, there's something I must tell you. Yes, Peter. I can't marry you. I'm very sorry, but I'm not in love with you, and it wouldn't be right. All right, Peter. If that's the way you want it. Perhaps you'll change your mind. I hope you will. 
What's that piece of paper you're holding? It's an epitaph. I copied it just now from a tombstone in St. Mark's churchyard. Whose epitaph is it? A girl who died 140 years ago. Peter, you're crying. Who was the girl? Peter, speak to me. Please, Marjorie. Please. Leave me alone. Very well, Peter. Here lies in the confident hope of the blessed resurrection and life eternal. Helen Pettigrew, beloved younger daughter of Sir William Pettigrew and Lady Anne Pettigrew, who departed this life June the 15th, 1787, aged 23 years. Oh, my dear. I've seen your shadow on the stairs. And I've seen your hand rest on this desk. And I've seen you sitting by that window. And you'll always be close to me in this house. You'll always be the living, beautiful soul of this house. And I know that we shall be together. Not in your time, nor in mine, but in God's. If miserable colds strike your family, the thing to do is to get busy right away with Vicks VapoRub. This is the modern way to relieve distress of colds that most mothers now use. Because VapoRub starts to work so quickly to clear the head, ease the coughing, soothe the sore throat and the muscular soreness and tightness. You just rub it on and VapoRub penetrates penetrates into the cold, congested upper bronchial tubes with its special, soothing medicinal vapors. At the same time, vapor rub stimulates, stimulates chest and back surfaces like a warming poultice. Vapor rub keeps on working for hours to bring welcome comfort and relief. It invites restful sleep, and often by morning, most of the misery of the cold is gone. Now be sure you get vapor rub. Because only VapoRub gives you this special, penetrating, stimulating action to relieve distress of colds. Vicks VapoRub. I am Adventure. Next week, come with me to meet a man who accepted a strange challenge and kept an exciting rendezvous with destiny. Until next week, then, I am dangerously yours. Our script, based on the play Barclay Square, was written by Gene Holloway and directed by Richard Sandville. The role of Helen was played by Gertrude Warner. The music for the series is under the direction of Mark Warno. Be sure and listen next week to another exciting adventure starring Victor Jory in Dangerously Yours.